So let's go ahead and resummarize and bring it home, so to speak. Um, going back to ISIS, and let me go ahead and summarize some of the major stuff. Um, and I have a, a new ISIS uh, pad up here with more information. Um, so here is our example again. Um, we have again we have two ways of naming it: oct one en for ein three all, or the alternate three hydroxy oct one en for ein. Um, so in summary, start from the side which is closest to the alcohol, even if you violate the alphabet rule when choosing the end to start numbering. So in this case right here, this example is pretty straightforward. We start from this side over here. Um, I'll go ahead and use the cursor. So we start from this side right here, 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 in order to name it, um, right to left. If you have a tie, such as this example that I'm lassoing, then you're going to name this from the side closest to the alcohol, closest to the alcohol. Um, they have the higher precedence, a.k.a. priority. So you start from the side on the alcohol. Um, in formal rules, they're so obsessed with this precedence that even if the side isn't closest to the end, um, the alcohol has a higher priority. And the book very subtly mentions that, so you really have to look for it. Um, two different names. If the alcohol has a suffix, then arrange the suffix order so that it's ene, ein, and all, provided there are alkenes and alkynes are present. So up here again, um, there is an alkene and alkyne, so it's going to be one ene, four ein, three all. The alcohol always goes at the very end. If using the alcohol as a prefix, then you need to alphabetize. Um, this is provided there's more than one um, functional group that would act as a prefix. So let's go back to this example. Here, there's a chloral group, which is a prefix, so therefore, um, it would be, the alternate name would be 4-chloro-2-hydroxy-pentane. Last but not least, if it's a, if you have two alcohols and you're using the suffix, then it's a di or tri. So in this example that I'm lassoing, then this would be a diol. A diol. If there are three, then it would be a triol. The alternate way of naming it as a prefix, 3,4-dihydroxyheptane. If there are three alcohols, then it would be a trihydroxy. So, moving on, we've talked about physical properties. You can review those. I have that in my previous commentary. So I'm just going to skip this part and go straight to ethers. Ethers. Um, so in this case, we have um, an oxygen, and it has alkyl groups on each side of the oxygen. Um, the ether could be part of the parent, or it could be a branch. I'm going to go straight to the bottom portion, where we see the ether is more like a parent, um, where one side isn't really bigger than the other. The best way to name these are as common names, as common names. So, and that's where most scientists refer to these. Um, so in this case, if you have two carbons on each side, then this is a di ethyl, diethyl, and then you put a space in between ether. After a while, this is so common that people sometimes refer to this as an ether, and that's actually the molecule they're referring to. Um, the UPAC name is one eth oxyethane, um, but uh, I'll probably give you the common name if I want you to sketch it. Let's go to the ISIS. I'm going to go ahead and scroll on down. If we take a look on the right-hand side, I want you to memorize the three common names for the following molecules. Um, in this case, if there's a carbon on each side, this is going to be called a dimethyl ether, dimethyl ether, because there's two methyls, one on each side. You put a space in between, ether. If, and this is the example on the slide, if you have two carbons on each side, one, oops, one, two, and then one, two. This is a diethyl ether. And then finally, if you have um, one side where there's a methyl, whoops, there, one side which is a methyl, let me lasso it, 
and you have the other side which is a ethyl, then it's a methyl ethyl ether. These are the only three common names I'd expect you to memorize. Usually I'll have you um, perform the UPAC method. Going back to the slides really quick, the UPAC is usually used whenever you have a um, ether which is a branch of a parent. So in this case, let me go ahead and and highlight using my yellow marker the branch. This is the branch right here. Um, so when the ether is part of is a branch and connected to obviously a parent, then we have to use the alkoxy prefix. And I'm highlighting this in the upper right hand corner, the alkoxy al alkoxy prefix. What we do is we count the number of carbons in the branch which is connected to the oxygen. In this case there are two carbons. We then go back to our names. We know that meth is for one, eth is for two, prop is for three, but is for four. Two carbons, then this is going to be a eth group. We're then going to combine the oxy portion, the oxy portion. So in this case it would be F oxy. This is a branch name so we have to put this in the front of the parent. Um, we number it from the side closest to the functional group unless it's an alcohol and then whatever side is closest to the alcohol. So in this case carbon 1, carbon 2, carbon 3, carbon 4. So this is going to be on carbon 2, location number 2, ethoxybutane. Let's go back to my ISIS examples in the um, so in the lower left hand corner and you have to kind of scroll down on my ISIS examples because they're all packed together. Um, if they're using the UPAC name for ether as a branch let me go ahead and highlight this on the very bottom. You need to go ahead and add the alkyl branch name for number of carbons, which we just talked about in front of the word oxy. Hence, two carbons, eth oxy. Um, so, if you have multiple carbons, um, uh, multiple branches, again, you have to use the alphabet method. So, alphabetize the prefix arrangement. So, looking in my uh, left example right here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and lasso one of them. In this case, because there's two carbons coming off the oxygen, this is going to be a eth oxy. An eth oxy. Notice there's only one carbon, which I'm lassoing right now. That's going to be a meth oxy, because there's only one carbon coming off. Um, we're counting the side closest to the functional group. In this case, we're going from right to left, so it's going to be a, and then if we arrange it, it will be a 4 ethoxy, 3 methoxy. Notice we're arranging the branch names alphabetically. Um, so make sure you have it alphabetically. So alphab alphabetize the prefix arrangement, as you see right here. Alphabetize the prefix arrangement. Let's go to this ugly monstrosity right here. Ooh, that's a big one. Um, in this case, I went ahead and highlighting this portion right here. There's two carbons coming off, so this would be an eth oxy. Um, we have, if I were to sit there and use the alcohol as a prefix, it would be a, f a uh, using the alternate name, 4 eth oxy, 5 hyd hydroxy, and then you have your parent, deck, and in this, in this case, 1 ene, 6 ine. There really should be a dash right there, so let me change that. Oops, let me change the right side. There we go. When in six ein. On the other hand, if you use alcohol as a suffix, then it doesn't matter about arranging it alphabetically. Four ethoxy, deck one in, six ein, five all. Notice on this side, uh, or in this case, one, two, three, four, five carbons to get to the alcohol group. One, two, three, four. Five, six 
carbons to get to the alcohol group. So in this case, um, we're going to be going, counting from left to right. The alcohols have priority, precedence. And let's go ahead and finish up these right here. Um, you can have cyclic ethers. So in this case right here, here is a um, cycloalkene and the oxygen makes up part of the um, ring. So these are heterocyclic rings because they contain different atoms. We can also have um, highlighting in yellow. We can also have many functional groups added to these heterocyclic rings. Consequently, we call these polyfunctional because there's many functional groups added to these heterocyclic rings. Um, I may ask you to memorize or make up an example. I want to have you memorize these here, at least not yet. That's in the biochem portion. But for right now, I could ask you to make up an example of a polyfunctional heterocyclic ring. Or I can give you this as an example and ask you, please go ahead and name this. Um, what type of ring is this? So you have options on this part. Moving on. Um, we've covered this in the previous so make sure you review that. Phenols um, in slide 8, 28. Um, we talked about naming uh, phenol derivatives in the past. So take a look at um, the previous chapter 1, 2 slides dealing with a uh, common name um, benzene molecule derivatives. And they have phenol on there. Um, for the most part, let's just stick with phenol right now. Phenol can act as a weak acid where the hydrogen comes off bonding to uh, water. Um, hence, it has this temporary portion. Um, this, therefore, makes it slightly soluble. The polar um, hydrogen bonding alcohol group um, can make it slightly soluble and overcome the nonpolar um, and forces of the benzene. Um, so it's a pretty toxic, um, although it's a nice uh, precursor for making vitamins. <laughs> Isn't this funny? Just by adding a couple branches, alkyl branches here, here, and here, we can make it from a very potent poison to a um, to a vitamin. Um, which can break down um, your superoxides, which have been known to destroy uh, cells and contribute to the aging process, hence we call these antioxidants. And these can be found in uh, food. I'm not going to have you memorize this, but I just want to show you how, just by changing the functional groups, we can go ahead and change the properties. And going from killing you to improving your lifespan is, is, is quite a change in properties. This concludes our um, Chapter 3-4, Part 1.